NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. So it's my uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to engage you in this way, though I doubt that you necessarily got up this morning and wanted to have a really and sort of, um, how shall I put it, um, an uplifting conversation about race and police violence, but, but, but here we all are. Um, so what I thought I might do in the limited time that I have is to give you a sense of the ways in which I've been thinking about race and police violence over the past few years. Clearly, this is a topic of concern um, and has been a topic of concern for some time, given uh, the United States' relationship uh, to race and police violence. So I'm hoping that you can tell me whether my uh, preliminary ways of thinking about it uh, resonates with you in any uh, particular way. My, my starting point for this presentation is to suggest that taking up the question of race and police violence, like any other social problem, requires us to ask a question about frame. Uh, lawyers especially, I think, understand that how you frame a social problem shapes how you imagine solutions to that social problem. And with respect to race and police violence specifically, it seems to me that we have to evidence the willingness and the capacity to think both big and small. And that sounds abstract, I know. So let me try and give you a sense of what I mean first with respect to um, thinking big. So I'm a board member of the African-American Policy Forum, and when we give presentations on race, we sometimes invite people to engage this particular image. It's an image of cows, not of people. And the exercise goes something like this. Let's stipulate that the cows are sick. Uh, the question then becomes, why are the cows sick? And if I had time, we would go back and forth. And if past is prologue, your responses to the question, why are the cows sick, would track uh, two sets of answers. So one set of answers would focus on the cows themselves. So the cows are sick because of something the cows are doing or not doing. The cows are sick because they're not grazing, they're not drinking enough water. The cows are sick because they're not pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, let's say. So one set of uh, responses focus specifically on uh, the cows. Another set of responses focus on the farmer. So the cows are sick because of something the farmer is doing to the cow or something the farmer is failing to do for the cow. It might be the case that the farmer is a cow cyst, analogous to a racist, you get the idea. So it's either the cows that we're blaming on the one hand or the farmer that we're blaming. But if we pull back the frame, if we think big, we begin to see that the cows exist in a toxic environment. So quite apart from what the farmer is doing to the cows, and quite apart from what the cows might be failing to do for themselves, they're gonna be sick. And the question is whether or not when we think about problems of race, we think about it structurally. So we're not just focused on individual police officers engaging in individual acts of violence against individual people, but we think about the problem more systemically. So that's what I mean by thinking big, and I'll invite you to do just that as we carry on uh, throughout the day. With respect to thinking small, the question is whether or not we ought to take up um, the issue of implicit bias. I know you all know something of implicit bias. So in many respects, what I will say about that uh, presumably already uh, resonates with what you know. Uh, nevertheless, I do want to introduce you to some um, new findings in that space that may or may not be relevant to the work that you're doing. So implicit bias is a way to think small, by which I mean we're moving from the individual to the mind. And the easiest way to think about what's at stake uh, with respect to implicit bias, it seems to me, is to recognize that it derives fundamentally from the problem of automatic processing. That's both a problem and an opportunity. We cannot navigate the social world without automatically processing information. If we were to slow down and think about everything we do, we would create a kind of social gridlock. So it absolutely is the case then that social categorization is an automatic feature of social cognition. So a couple of concrete examples might go like this. If I show these images and I say, what is this? You don't have to think about it, presumably. 
you know that these are chairs. They're not all the same to be sure, but you can easily identify them. You don't have to waste any cognitive resources doing so. You're just there automatically, it's a chair. And if I were to say, well, what kind of associations might one form with respect to a chair? Again, I don't think you have to spend much time, much cognitive resources to answer that particular question. You sit on a chair. If you're Tom Cruise, you might stand on a chair, but, but you get the idea. You might nap on a chair. There are particular kind of associations that you form between chairs and our social lives that don't require you to spend a lot of time thinking. Um, the problem, it seems to me, uh, is that we also engage in this process, this automatic processing um, of people. Thus, the problem of implicit bias. So if I were to show you this image, it's an image of me, then again, automatic categorization happens. So to put it the way my kids might, you hashtag me. There are a particular set of hashtags that flow from my particular embodiment, professional, black, tall, etc. And we can talk more specifically about automatic processing along two dimensions. So I want to pause and suggest that when we think about the automatic processing of people, it's really, 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 one more time, really important that we distinguish between attitudes on the one hand and stereotypes on the other. So let me say more about what I mean by that. So with respect to attitudes here, I'm not asking you to answer the question about whether I have an attitude. Uh, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking instead whether or not you form attitudes of people that are implicit. And what do I mean by attitudes? I mean whether you evidence warmth uh, with respect to particular people, whether you evidence like or dislike, whether or not you give people a thumbs up or a thumbs down. That's roughly what we mean by attitudes. Stereotypes are altogether different. So by stereotypes, we mean group generalizations. So with respect to African-Americans in particular, there are a bunch of stereotypes. I don't think I need to tell you anything new. There are two in particular we could focus on here that you know, black people, we can all dance, we're all athletic. I might actually want to claim these stereotypes, except my kids will tell me that I cannot dance. Uh, I'm not a particularly good athlete. But you get the general idea. Stereotypes are group generalizations. Attitudes are, again, warmth, like, and dislike. And the crucial thing to keep in mind is that stereotypes and attitudes um, travel in different directions, by which I mean you can have a positive attitude about someone and a negative stereotype. So here's a concrete example. I might like African Americans on the one hand and think they're lazy or dangerous on the other hand. I might like Asian American, oh sorry, dislike Asian Americans and think they're smart. So it's important to recognize that attitudes and stereotypes can flow in different um, normative uh, directions. So let's think again about the difference between explicit bias and implicit bias. The distinction, I think, is obvious. Explicit bias we hold consciously. We own it. We act on them. We don't disavow them, necessarily. Implicit bias, we are not aware of them. So if I ping my brain and said, do I have implicit bias, I'm not going to get an answer. I cannot easily identify the implicit biases that I have, which then poses a problem. How do we get at implicit bias if we cannot do so introspectively? And the answer is that we might measure it. And that itself invites another question, how? So I want to give you a quick sense of how we measure implicit biases as a point of departure for thinking about how it might be manifested in the kind of work that you do. So the easiest way to think about um, measuring implicit bias is to have you participate in this Stroop test. So this is a moment where your um, collective participation is uh, important. Uh, I know it's early uh, for all of us. But the task is really, really easy. All you have to do is identify these colors. So if I were to say identify the colors in column one, you can do it. Presumably, you all know your colors. It's green, red, purple, green, blue, yellow, blue, red. You get the idea. So I'm just asking you uh, to read out a bunch of colors. So let's do that. So um, after three, read out the colors from column one. One, two, three, go. OK, just pause. That was pretty pathetic. Um, I don't know how you can call yourself public uh, defense. No, come on, let's, let's, let's seriously, let's think about the, so as quickly as you can, as quickly as you can, column two, loudly. 
All right, we're warming up. Column three. We all right, so again, just one more time. All we're doing is getting you to realize that you know your colors, and I know, and you know that you know your colors. So one more time, identify the colors. Column one. You do not know your colors. You had such confidence. Where did your confidence go? So you had Stevie Wonder here yesterday, but I want to ask the Marvin Gaye question. What's going on? So, 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 so what's going on? Why are you making errors here? Why? Anyone, just tell me. What's going on? The words are different than the colors. In other words, it's a moment of mismatch. And that moment of mismatch, that basic insight that when concepts don't match, it causes grit, is precisely the insight that underwrites the implicit association test. So let me give you a concrete indication of what I might mean. So identifying black people as good is like identifying the color red in the word green. That's a mismatch. That's like grit. There's a stop sign. We don't want to form that particular association, it turns out. On the other hand, identifying black as bad, that's like identifying the color green in the word green. We can do that pretty easily. We do it quickly. Um, we can see the same dynamic with respect to white. So the implicit bias test roughly measures the speed at which we form particular kinds of associations. How many of you have taken this test, by the way? So some of you have, and you, those of you who have know that you can take the test um, for religion, for sexual orientation, for age, et cetera. And the basic idea, again, is to try and ascertain the extent to which we might have internalized particular social meanings about uh, race. And it's the reaction time delta, the difference between um, the time that we associate white with good and black with good that roughly uh, we call uh, implicit bias. And in many respects, I don't think that we need to turn to the science of implicit uh, bias to understand, it seems to me, these social meanings about race. Um, these particular image, anyone remember these images? What, what are they? They're Katrina images. And you might remember as well that they engendered some amount of controversy because of the way in which they were framed. Right? The, the, the idea being that uh, black people loot and white people find. There was some amount of um, contestation about whether, in fact, the black people were looting and whether, in fact, the white people were finding, which is beside the point. The question is whether or not there was already an available frame so that that particular set of captions make more sense to us than if we switch it up. And so there's something at play with respect to why those images were captioned in the way that they were that links up precisely to this question of uh, implicit bias. We can think about this another way. Uh, this uh, uh, particular slide isn't working as well as I would like, but the basic idea that the headline, the MSNBC headline read, um, America beats Kwan, when Michelle Kwan is an American, the notion, of course, is that America beats uh, a foreigner. And we can decode that further to know that it's the Asian American who's standing in for the foreigner and the white woman in this instance, uh, Lipinski, who's standing in for uh, the American. It turns out that the Seattle Times repeated the same faux pas uh, years later. What was shocking about that is that the Seattle Times reported on the MSNBC headline, how could the MSNBC make this terrible racial mistake? And there it goes, producing the same uh, racial mistake uh, years later. What I'm trying to suggest here is that this, again, is a moment in which we associate Asian Americans as foreigners, as not really America. Where are you from? Los Angeles. No, where are you really from? I mean, those kinds of engagements are fundamentally about the extent to which a group is imagined to be outside of the American body politic. It's just another story about implicit bias that we don't need some IAT test to tell us about. We already know, it seems to me, that this uh, phenomenon is uh, quite real. And to just put a finer point on it, we can think about whether the looting frame for African-Americans 
um, is basically a frame in which the green word is covered with the color green, and the finding frame would be a moment in which um, we have uh, the word uh, green uh, embedded in the color red. So all of this to say again that the implicit bias uh, literature is really helpful because it empiricizes a particular phenomenon, but I don't know that we need that phenomenon to tell us that implicit bias is real, even as you might very well ask who me, and I say yes, and you still want to doubt the existence of um, the phenomenon. And I think uh, the last thing I will say here is that those of you who might still be skeptical about this. It's been studied over and over and over and over again, and I don't want to spend uh, much uh, time going into it, except to say across each of these axes, these are all moments in which the studies reveal preferences for the dominant group. So with respect to age, we like young people. Race, we like white people. Sexual orientation, we prefer straight people, et cetera, and so on. And what's interesting with age, um, it seems to me, is that you might think, that precisely because all of us at some point find ourselves on the other side of age, if we're lucky, that would be really, really, really motivated, would be really motivated to think the right way with respect to biases. That is to say, we would not evidence bias against uh, people who are older because we hope to be one of those people. It's not like white people grow up thinking, I better uh, check my bias against black people because one day I'm going to be black. Uh, that doesn't happen. But with respect to age, that happens. And it still is the case that we evidence that bias. And indeed, older people evidence implicit bias against older, pe older people. So there's something going on here that is about our socialization, our internalization of values about groups that the implicit bias phenomenon um, tries to capture. I won't, in the context of this presentation, give you an indication of what we know about the relationship between implicit bias and real world behavior, but there is evidence to suggest that at least at the margins, it matters. So I don't want to overstate the claim. It's not the case that social psychologists has demonstrated a one-to-one -one correspondence between implicit bias and action. They haven't done that but they have demonstrated the extent to which it matters in a range of contexts. And there's another study that I'll point to you further along um, in the presentation. The final thing I wanna say about implicit bias before moving on is this. It ain't all about implicit bias. You know, implicit bias in some respect is the darling uh, discursive term to think about problems of race today. A lot of biases are explicit, C.E.G. Donald Trump. Uh, or CEG Trumpism more generally. Uh, so I think it's important. See Charlottesville. I mean, there's just, we, ha we have now profound evidence that um, the problem of racism is quite real, it's quite deep, it's quite profound, and we ought not uh, ignore it, nor should we simply think of it as an implicit phenomenon, even as implicit bias, I think, is a useful framework to get at uh, very real biases that we might not, in fact, uh, know we have. So I've suggested that we need to think big, structurally. I'll give you a way of thinking about that. Think small, cognitively. Uh, but in taking up the question of police violence, it seems to me we also need to have another frame in mind, that when we talk about it, that we recognize its gender dimension. My colleague, Kimberly Crenshaw, for example, has spent some amount of time trying to put the question of police violence as it impacts uh, black women on the table. I'm talking about African-Americans here today. We could easily be having conversations about Latinos. We could easily be having conversations about Asian-Americans, about Native Americans. So, so the problem is not unique to any particular group. And it's certainly a problem that's gendered in ways that we have to, it seems to me, um, be mindful of. So what I want to do now uh, then is introduce the model that I've been working through uh, that provides this thinking big way of um, understanding race and police violence. The question I'm trying to ask again is, if it's the case that we know that African Americans have been subject to police violence forever, um, what factors today might help to explain the persistence of that dreadful uh, social problem? And the two first dimensions of the model that I want you to think about, I'm hoping is intuitive, which is this, repeated police interactions 
exposes African Americans to the possibility of violence. So I'll repeat that. Repeated police interactions exposes African Americans to the possibility of violence. What that means concretely is that if you're outside of the zone of police contact, you're outside of the zone of the possibility of police violence. So it's crucial to understand as a first instance, as a preliminary matter, why are people having contact with the police? Because if you solve the police contact problem, people cannot be killed. So just as a preliminary matter, it seems to me, we have to begin understanding the social forces that are at play that structuralizes African-Americans' contact with the police as a predicate for thinking how we might solve the problem. It doesn't mean that every single contact moment with the police officer leads to violence. It does mean that if you are outside of those contact moments, you're absolutely not going to experience uh, police violence. So addressing this preliminary question seems to me to be terribly um, important. The third feature on the model, again, I think is rather intuitive and I certainly don't need to talk to this crowd about, which is to say a problem of police culture, police training and police unions. If police culture encourages violence, that's what you'll see. If police trainings disattend violence, that's what you see. If police unions are overly protective of police officers and do not put in place mechanisms to hold them accountable, violence is what you will see. Nothing particularly remarkable there. Um, the next feature of the model tries to ask something like the following question, and you can't see it clearly, so I'll explain it. The question is this. So stipulate that you have some incidents of police violence. So police violence has happened. How does that violence interact with the legal system? How does the legal system process, if you like, that violence? And there are a number of answers to that question that I think should be on our minds. One is justifiable force. Police violence plus the legal system equals justifiable force. You more than anyone else understands that. A prosecution's decision not to file charges is a moment in which police violence is being translated into justifiable force. Or a prosecutor says, I'm gonna file charges and a grand jury refuses to indict. That's a moment in which police violence is being translated into justifiable force. The prosecutor files charges, the grand jury uh, indicts, but the trial fact says reasonable force. These are all moments in which police violence enters the legal system as an input and comes out as justifiable force as an output. So we should be thinking about uh, that dynamic, it seems to me. Another dynamic is the qualified immunity dynamic. Again, I don't need to say much about that to this particular audience. And at any rate, if I went into the doctrinal thicket of qualified immunity, you would say, come back, Devon, come back, and I won't be able to come back because as you well know, it's a messed up body of law. Descriptively, it's fair to say that qualified immunity as a doctrine makes it difficult to hold police officers accountable for their acts of violence. That's not a controversial claim. Whatever your views about police violence might be, it's not controversial. What's controversial is that some people think that's a good thing and some people think that's a bad thing. But the idea that it erects a high bar is not, I think, a descriptively inaccurate. And then there's the indemnification problem. Again, you know more about this than I. Now, even assuming you overcome the qualified immunity barrier, police officers don't themselves end up paying much. So my colleague Joanna Schwartz has done a study on this, and you can see the yawning gap, the yawning gap, the yawning gap between what individual officers play on the one hand and what cities and municipalities pay on the other. Right? So the indemnification problem is uh, a problem as well. And the final dynamic here uh, that I mean to put into place is you try holding a police department liable for the act of uh, violence in which its officers engage. You know the answer to that is good luck. Um, you're not gonna win that particular law school. So why do I care about um, justifiable force? Why do I care about uh, the indemnification and qualified immunity? Why do I care about the difficulty of holding police departments liable? Think about it this way. If a police officer, a police system understands that police officers' acts of violence are gonna be translated into justifiable force, or we're never gonna be able to sue them, we're never gonna be able to hold departments liable. That creates a disincentive for officers to exercise care. If they know at the front end that, look, there's no way you're gonna get me at the back end, that structures, it creates a broad incentive structure for police officers not to think very carefully about when they might mobilize violence. Now, we could talk about all of these 
factors in much greater detail. Each of them, in a way, are their own structures. Um, but the point I want to focus on here is point one. What are some of the variables that cause people to have police interactions to begin with? So that's where I want to go now in the model. I've already talked about biases. That's quite obvious. If you think a group is dangerous and violent, that's what you're going to have. Police officers interacting with them because they're presumed to be dangerous and violent. And I'll point to a study on that in just a minute. There's a mass criminalization problem. We talk a lot about mass incarceration. We ought to be talking about mass criminalization as well. And I'll give you a specific indication of what I might mean. Predatory policing, you all know something about that as well. I'll give you a sense of to how that was structuralized in Ferguson. And finally, Fourth Amendment, uh, to the extent we have time. So let me point out this study. It's a really interesting study. It was conducted by one of my co-authors. Um, and the project of this study was this. Let's see if we can figure out a relationship between blackness on the one hand and criminality and dangerousness on the other. And here's how the um, researchers uh, pursued that particular inquiry. So subjects in this particular experiment were primed with black male faces or white male faces or no faces at all. And let's just be clear about what that means. You're sitting in front of your computer screen okay, um, in this experiment, and images of white faces or black faces appear before you, but you don't know that you've seen these images because they happen to pop in and out too quickly. So you're being primed, but you don't know it. Social psychologists are sneaky in this way. So everyone understand you've been primed with these faces or no face at all? That's move one. The next move is to identify, to have you identify particular objects. And there are two objects about which we're concerned here. So one is a crime-relevant object that you have to identify. So a handcuff is a crime-relevant object, or a gun. And the other is a crime-irrelevant object like an iron. And I swear, every time I teach this to my students, I have to explain that's an iron. It's not some prehistoric tool. It's useful. I used it this morning. So, so it's an iron. The, the, the broader point is that you have a crime relevant object like a gun or a handcuff and a crime irrelevant object like an iron, right? And you might say, well, that's easy. The trick is that the objects appear before you at different levels of degradability, all right? So if I were to show you this particular image, it's not necessarily clear what it is. That's frame one. At frame 25, you can probably see that it's a gun, maybe. Um, at frame 41, you can certainly see that it's a gun. So the question again is this, at what frame, at what frame can you identify the gun as the gun? At what frame can you identify the iron as the iron as a function of being primed with a white male face versus the black male face versus no face at all? Everyone follow? So we're trying to see whether the prime is doing any work with respect to the speed at which you can identify these objects. And the work that Prime would be doing, obviously, is unconscious. It's not like some conscious thing. So here are some of the results. So again, uh, just to be clear, on the y-axis, you have the frames, like at what frame? Frame 1 versus frame 25, et cetera. And um, on the x-axis, you see the three conditions, whether you're primed with a white face, a black face, or no face at all. Everyone see that? So let's think first about uh, the crime um, irrelevant object. So what you'll note here is that there is no statistical difference, really, with respect to when you identify um, the iron as the iron um, uh, across these three conditions. You roughly identify them at frame 23. Okay, no difference with respect to the iron. If I now introduce the evidence with respect to uh, the handcuff, the results are strikingly different. So now we're looking at, okay, what happens under conditions when you've been primed with the black face or the white face or no face at all? So with respect to the white face, it's like, uh, I don't see the gun, it's not a 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 gun. Okay, finally, it's a gun. With respect to the black face, it's a gun. You see it real soon, as it were. 
right? And it's helpful to think about these two results vis-a-vis -vis the, the control condition, because the no phase prime, that's kind of the neutral one, right? That, that's when you haven't really uh, been primed with any particular phase. So in comparison to the position of quote unquote neutrality, you see again uh, what's happening with respect to blackness and whiteness. You might put the point this way, being primed with a black face facilitates your capacity to see the gun. Being primed with a white face inhibits your capacity to see the gun. There are lots and lots of evidence on this point, and you can think concretely about the relationship between that evidence and everyday policing. Clearly, there's some relevance here. There's greater relevance if I tell you that police officers were subjects in this particular experiment. So this isn't just with students, which many social psychology experiments are. This experiment included police officers themselves as part of uh, the study. All right, I've said enough about biases. Now I want to talk about mass criminalization. By mass criminalization, I mean the criminalization of relatively non-serious activities on the one hand, and I also mean the diffusion of criminal justice actors, criminal justice norms, and criminal justice practices into other domains of the welfare state. So for example, police officers in schools, that's a problem of mass criminalization, where you have the logics of the criminal justice system in other parts of the welfare states, or uh, the interaction between the criminal justice system and immigration, that's a problem of mass conversation as well. And remember, we're thinking about mass conversation like we're thinking about uh, implicit bias because we're trying to understand what are some of the social forces that cause African Americans to have contact with the police to begin with. So the mass conversation problem that I want to focus on is reflected in, for example, these particular activities which are criminalized across various jurisdictions in the United States. Again, I don't think I need to tell you this. You know this already. And you might note the extent to which, A, they're not particularly serious, B, they're vague, and C, you can construct them as the criminalization of poverty in, in many ways. So that already should cause concern. But wait, there's more. Because you can ask yourself whether against the backdrop of these particular crimes, um, police officers have a kind of free floating probable cause, by which I mean you leave the station house and you already have probable cause if these are the crimes. In other words, we should understand mass criminalization or the criminalization of relatively non-serious activities as a source of police empowerment. If these are crimes, then clearly, police officers can legitimately engage people who are engaging in these conduct which have been criminalized. So understanding police conduct and the extent to which it leads to repeated contact with African Americans, it seems to me, requires us to think hard about what counts as a crime to begin with. And the problem of mass criminalization has produced an array of crimes that makes it easy for police officers to engage uh, subjects on the street. And you can think about how this played itself out in Ferguson. Manner of walking on the sideway. That's, what, what is that? It's what black people do, apparently. Right? You can see the statistics, 95% of the people who have been subject to that were African American, disturbance of the peace. Again, terribly vague. So in order for us to think hard about police contact problem, we need to think harder about what are the predicates that stage it. And part of what I'm saying is, biases stage it, and mass criminalization stages it as well. So let me move on now to predatory policing. And by predatory policing, I mean the use of policing mechanisms for economically extractive reasons. So policing as a means of revenue generation is what I want to suggest. And clearly, we all saw this play itself out in Ferguson in ways that I think um, bears elaboration. So let me go to Ferguson and describe, if you like, the police contact world of predatory policing that remains um, shocking uh, to me, even if I've studied this over and over um, again. So the police contact world that we're concerned about uh, might start in this way. 
police officers are interacting with people in Ferguson, the first thing to note is in the middle, they can arrest you easily at the outset of that interaction. We know that given what I've just said about mass criminalization, it's really easy to arrest people. But the police officers might not necessarily arrest someone at the outset of an interaction. They might instead stop them and engage in some kind of discipline or social control. Right? That is to say, we can think about um, proactive policing where the charge or the project is not necessarily to arrest at the outset. Um, the problem is if you find yourself repeatedly subject to being stopped by the police, what do you do? You resist in some particular way. You assert rights in some particular way. And that too can clearly lead to your arrest. The basic story this diagram will tell is A, all interactions lead to arrest, and B, these arrests occur under conditions of economic extraction. That's the basic story. So if I'm in Ferguson, I'm constantly being stopped by the police every day, and I assert my rights, that's a failure to comply. I'm arrested. That's a part of the standard story of policing, not just in Ferguson, but in other parts of the US as well. I want to focus now on the um, citation and fine part of the diagram. Um, so the basic way in which fines and fees worked in Ferguson looks something like this. You get a fine that carried with it a mandatory court, of appear court appearance to the extent that you fail to show up. What happens? You're arrested. Let's say that you show up and you can't afford to pay your fine and there was no determination in Ferguson with respect to your economic ability to pay, you might get a higher fine. If you can't pay that higher fine, again, you're arrested. And um, this particular story about being arrested uh, against the backdrop of inability to pay was so profound that you can see just how it played itself out. 21,000 residents, um, 16,000 people with warrants, you don't look shocked, you don't look shocked. I don't know how to shock you if you don't look shocked. Um, in 2013, 9,000 warrants issued on 33,000 offenses. Even you should look shocked. You still don't look shocked. Um, and, and one of the reasons why we see that dynamic, by the way, is because this was the injunction on the part of the prosecutor. Pile it on. So when you stop someone for X, pile on Y and Z. So you saw in Ferguson predatory policing racialized, classed as an ordinary feature of governance, an ordinary feature of governance, an ordinary, unapologetically, this particular modality of policing was linked to the city governance structures in ways that have profound impacts on the lives of people living in that particular domain. Some of you I know have read the um, DOJ report on Ferguson, and if you haven't, you really should, because it's precisely an indication of the extent to which race and class was bureaucratized as an everyday feature of governance. It's sickening to read, and it's saddening to learn that it was not at all unique to Ferguson. In other words, the ordinariness of what the Ferguson report reveals about Ferguson, it turns out, is an ordinariness that characterizes policing across various jurisdictions in the United States. So in many ways, we initially understood Ferguson as a sui generis um, dimension of um, policing, but in fact, it's more uh, generalizable than typically we think. The rest of this uh, schematic is really intended to suggest that people who were arrested, what happens? They end up incarcerated. They can't post bail. Think about the collateral consequences of that with respect to job opportunities, impacts on their social life with respect to housing. The very fact of money bail as a problem itself was a trajectory to arrest. So predatory policing, I want to suggest, is another reason why uh, we we can expect um, African Americans to have um, repeated pol interactions with the police. So I've talked about biases, I've talked about mass conversation, I've talked about predatory policing. I want to end with a few words about um, uh, the Fourth Amendment. 
So I don't think I can teach you anything about the Fourth Amendment. You can teach me an awful lot, I am sure. What I want to say first, going back to our model, is that the Fourth Amendment is all over the place here. The Fourth Amendment plays a role staging police interactions to begin with in ways that I'll describe in a minute before shutting up. And the Fourth Amendment plays a role in the middle in terms of what happens in the context of an arrest. What does the Fourth Amendment allow police officers to do? And the Fourth Amendment plays a role at the end vis-a-vis -vis the question of when is force reasonable. So I'm going to talk just about the front end uh, dimension of the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures, ostensibly. So what that means doctrinally, you all know, is that there are two big questions that we ask ourselves uh, with respect to Fourth Amendment law. Question one is, is the Fourth Amendment even triggered by way of a search and seizure? If it's not, the Fourth Amendment has nothing to say about what the officers did. So the first move is just a move about whether or not the Fourth Amendment is even implicated by way of a search and seizure. That's move one, that's the trigger question. Second, if it is um, triggered, then you all know the question is whether or not the conduct is reasonable. So let's just focus on the trigger question. So assume that Mary is standing on the street corner and the officer has no reason to think that she has done anything wrong. You know that the officers can engage in a bunch of relatively coercive conduct without implicating the Fourth Amendment, including following Mary, questioning Mary about any of the items that are listed on the pop. Where have you, where you been? Where are you going, et cetera. Mary is ostensibly free to leave. Right, so none of these are moments in which the Fourth Amendment is implicated. Mary should feel empowered to simply say, talk to the hand, police officer. That's, that's the fiction that underwrites Fourth Amendment law, and I think you all understand that. So questions about immigration status, this list just continues the problem. I'm not gonna read it out, you can see it. These are all forms of conduct in which police officers can engage without triggering the Fourth Amendment. Which is to say, the officers need no justification ex ante, no indication that Mary has done anything wrong if it's not a search or seizure. So every time the court concludes that this or that conduct is not a search or seizure is a moment in which the court is saying, go do that, police officers. Go interact with that person on those terms. You don't have to justify it. So it's critically important that Fourth Amendment law delimits the space between people and the police in ways that, again, contribute to uh, the police contact problem uh, that I've uh, been describing. And the voluntary interviewing uh, part is particularly pernicious. So some FBI agent knocks on a door of a person, uh, says, hey, uh, do you wanna come down to the FBI station for questioning? And the person goes. That is understood to be a voluntary moment. That is voluntariness, a la uh, Supreme Court Fourth Amendment uh, jurisprudence. The problem for all of this is worse, which is to say that list is basically just a list of examples that I've just presided, so I don't expect you to read it. The point is, if you stipulate that police conduct is racially motivated along the lines that I've just described, the Fourth Amendment doesn't care. Because if it's not a search or seizure to begin with, it's irrelevant whether or not it's motivated. And with respect to the enforcement of immigration in particular, the problem's even worse. The Supreme Court has said clearly that apparent Mexican ancestry, what is that, you tell me, can be a basis for suspicion vis-a-vis -vis whether or not you're undocumented. And you all might forget how 14th Amendment jurisprudence works in this respect. The court says, look, if we take race into account in the context of affirmative action, we got to strictly scrutinize that. God forbid we take race into account for racial mediation purposes. Strict scrutiny really justify it. If we take race into account with respect to determining whether or not someone is undocumented, no strict scrutiny. No strict scrutiny. We're just going to let law enforcement do that. That's the kind of asymmetry that exists in constitutional law writ large in ways that instantiates the very thing that the Constitution is supposed to um, eliminate, which is to say racial inequality. My broader point is that this trigger question is 
the Fourth Amendment triggered creates so much space for police officers to legally and constitutionally engage people that it sets the stage on which uh, police violence might occur. The second part of that is that, again, if those forms of conduct which we say are not seizures or searches, they can be racially motivated. Um, the test for a seizure is this, whether a reasonable person feels free to leave or otherwise terminate the encounter. You all know this test. Maybe we should blacken it a little bit. You know, whether a reasonable black person. You might say, well, that's silly, Devon. Now you go too far. How radical an idea is that? But if we think about where the Supreme Court has gone, for example, with respect to age, the Supreme Court with respect to age has basically said, you can take age into account in determining whether or not someone's in custody. It doesn't mean that you adopt a 13-year-old standard or 14 year old It just means that you understand that age matters. Why we can't do so with race is beyond me. Why we can't tell a story that against the backdrop of the history of racialized policing in this context, race matters, which is the subject of this particular conference, I don't know. It's a broader problem of law with respect to its elision of race that, again, ends up producing the very thing law is supposed to ameliorate, which is to say um, uh, inequality. So I want to uh, stop there and simply say that the problem that Fourth Amendment law presents in this respect is not just at the front end. Uh, you can think about multiple ways in which the Supreme Court has said that, OK, the Fourth Amendment is triggered by way of a search and seizure, but that's reasonable. Right? Think about that in the context of stop and frisk. Think about that in the context of traffic stop. And I think when you add all of that up, you begin to understand that when we have conversations about police violence that has as a point of departure the notion that police officers are violating the law, that's a very limited way of thinking about it. By which I mean many times police officers are doing what the law empowers them to do. That's not a great message for you because you want to make the, law, the argument that it's illegal. I'm with you. I'm simply saying that it's important to understand that many forms of racialized policing, many acts of violence that we see, have as their constitutional foundation uh, the Fourth Amendment as authorizing that conduct. So from my perspective, it's important that uh, we name that so that we can begin to see that the problem of race and policing is not just a problem of individual officers engaging in individual acts of violence against individual people. It's a more systemic problem in which all of the factors that I've described, including but clearly not limited to uh, Fourth Amendment law, is doing work. So thank you all very much uh, for your attention.